today's video going to be playing a game of Madden 24, talking about kind of what I'm doing, going through it. I uh, wanted to drop a video kind of explaining something, a couple things as well as we kind of head into kind of the, the off season as well as with Madden 25 coming out here in a few short months and, and college football 25 actually coming out uh, in hopefully July. I think the Madden 25 beta literally starts next month and then we're going to be into college football season. And so wanted to kind of, um, you know, break some stuff down as we kind of head into that. I know a lot of you guys are looking for as Dickerson just absolutely <laughs> takes me to the house. I'm not even going to try to catch him. My team's a little bit out of date. Uh, we'll just let that be what it is. Um, but I know a lot of you guys are trying to get better at Madden, and I also know a lot of you guys are probably going to be very interested in, in, in looking to get better at NCAA as well when NCAA drops, and so or college football. It's going to take me a long time to realize that it's college football because I played NCAA forever. So what we're going to do for that on our channel and what we're going to do for that on our uh, as far as ebooks and stuff go is we actually started a new website uh, or a new online community because I found that Patreon was a little bit difficult to navigate for people. And this new platform called school is going to do a much, much better job of just making it easier for you guys to access all of your eBooks, all of your pro tips, and also a much better user interface for allowing you to get your questions answered, have Q and A's and all of that stuff. So we're switching over to school, school.com slash Cody Ballard. I'll put a link to that in the description. It's the same exact price as our Patreon membership was. It's just $10 a month and it gets you access to all of our offensive and defensive ebooks so if you want to get better at madden if you want to get better at ncaa i think it's the best place to get better because we're going to be running content for an entire year on both games a lot of people um they will just basically play college football until madden comes out and then they all go all in on madden we're actually going to do we're going to be going all in on both games so we're going to have full a full year's worth of ebook support and ebook releases for college football and for madden for the same price just ten dollars gets you in and as kind of a little bonus for those of you guys that sign up early on our school.com page the first 500 people to sign up on our school.com platform they will get a free complete film review from me on really as much film as they want as many games as they want uh, we're going to be doing film reviews for people trying to help people give them actionable advice that is going to help them you know become better uh, madden and and hopefully as well college football players so if you guys want to get access to that Make sure you're in that site. Again, it's only $10 to join, and I think it's the best place uh, to become a better Madden player. That being said, what I wanted to talk about in terms of Madden and college football today is kind of my, uh, my strategy or my, my system or my approach to thinking about offense and, and defense. And really, we're going to start with offense, and we'll kind of work to defense. But basically – the idea or the philosophy that I have and have really found works best over the over the last decade. I've been playing Madden for I, I, I literally started my YouTube channel in Madden 12. Started playing Madden fairly seriously in Madden 10, Madden 11, uh, but got pretty decent at Madden 12. So, anyways, that's kind of how it's kind of my Madden story. So I've been playing Madden for quite a while, and in my time <laughs> of playing Madden, I kind of found this basic framework that you want to think through and it is power counter constraint and the i actually took this from a real nfl team the night i was a super big fan uh super super fan of vince lombardi and the 60s packers did a lot of research on them and what i found in studying them was they were famous for running the lombardi sweep the lombardi sweep lombardi literally it's a direct quote he said this is a play we must make go this is a play we will make go and this is a play we're going to run again and again and again they committed to the power sweep they established the power sweep they mastered the power sweep I believe that one of the coaches uh, in a coach's clinic that Vince Lombardi was a part of, he literally talked for almost or over an hour on the intricate de details of the blocking in the power sweep and how it changed based off of, you know, what front you were giving them, for example. The point is they had a power play. They had a power play that they committed to and that they mastered and that they executed at a super high level. And there was a very specific defense 
that they had to that 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 would be able to defend the power sweep, and that was really the the Landry four three flex defense, was where the four three defense kind of came from, and it was really this idea of trying to kind of set the edge. Uh, really, this four three even six one. This was kind of the method to defending the Packer sweep. So what was vulnerable or what was left vulnerable by 4-3 even 6-1, you might ask? Well, it was oftentimes what was known as the counter or the power trap. Uh, so the counter or the power trap, just a little quick hitter. Looks like the power sweep, but the blocking kind of cuts and you're able to really attack the middle of the defense versus the edges of the defense. So the counter kind of took it, the counter play took advantage of the over pursuing nature that was required to stop the power play. That is a really important point. And I hope that you don't miss, if you don't, if you miss everything else I said in the video, please don't miss that. The counter play took advantage of what the power of what you had to do to defend the power play. The counter play took advantage of what you had to do to defend the power play. That is so, so, so important, guys, because in Madden, that is pretty much the philosophy and the strategy for the schematics. You want to have a play that you establish, a high percentage, good quality play that beats the majority of defenses that you will face. And it can be a lot of different things. It could be a stretch. It could be a bubble screen. It could be a rollout. It could be, I mean, there's a lot of different things you can do. You just have to pick one. You just have to pick what are you, what are you going to commit to? What are you going to get good at? And there's reasons why people choose certain things. You know, some people, you know, this, this is also where you kind of get the term meta. Most effective play in Madden 24, probably double post. Double post, one of the best plays in the game this year. Double corners, a really good play. You can make a power play out of all of those. It's just whatever it is that you want to commit to and establish. That is, that is the important, like, big, big, big point. Okay, so you have a power play and that power play can only really be defended by a couple of very specific adjustments that your opponent can do. That is important. So they have to do something to stop you. If they don't have to do anything to stop you, then it's not really that good of a play and it's going to be hard to commit to that play over and over and over again. So that, that that's a big, big point. And that's that's a huge point for the power play. And you have to have a good power play. If you don't have a good power play, then your counter play really doesn't matter. All right. And that's a super underrated point. If you don't have a good power play, your, your counter play, it really doesn't matter if you have the best counter play in the world. If, it, if your power play is not putting the defense in a position where they have to be vulnerable, then your counter play is not going to make that big of a difference. So you have to have a good counter or a power play. And not only do you have to have a good play, but you have to be able to execute that play at a high level, a repeatable level, a level that you can do again and again and again. That is super, super important, guys. Super important. So, you know, that that to me, it, it just really can't be over overstated how important a good power, a quality, good quality power play is in the picture of schematics. Right. So then the next thing that is important, and there are other things that are important, is understanding. Wow, I can't believe you completed that. What your power play, what your what, what is open or what what they have to do to take away your power play and what that then leaves open, because it almost always is going to leave something open for you from a counterplay perspective. So, for example, this 4-3, even 6-1 defense, it's a pretty good job against stretches. It's a pretty good job against um, certain types of runs. And then there are some other plays or some other runs that it doesn't do you know, nearly as good against. So that's important to kind of think through as well. Uh, it kind of plays into the whole idea of power counter uh, constraint, okay? So from a power perspective, and this is, you can, I'm going to use my Jets offense to kind of think, help kind of bring this home. So in the Jets playbook, the power play is really the uh, double corner. Double corner is the best double corner in the game. The corner strike double corner is really good. And I think he fumbled there. <laughs> um, the double corner is really good out of that. And you need to be committing to the double corner. The double corner is the best. So it's the best play in the formation. It's the best play in the formation. It's the best play in the playbook. So why is that important? 
because we want to understand then what does the defense have to do to defend double corner well. Number one, they can user it, but really if they user it, it's going to be tight and they're going to have to you know do a lot to stop that backside drag. The second thing that they can do is they can run a kind of cut of a roll coverage or cover three cloud type of defense. And that has to come or that has to roll over the top of the bunch side. Uh, and then the other thing they can do is run kind of like a cover three double flat. It's a little bit more unique than a, it's not a cover two double Mabel. It's a cover three double flat. The reason that's important is because if they run a cover three double flat, the cover three double flat here to the right side, it's not going to be able to defend it's not going to be able to defend some of the other things we could do. Another thing they can do is blitz us, which this guy might be ready to do here. You know, he might be able to send the goons. But guess what? We have these quick reads, and we we love when that happens when they just strip you after you throw a wide open player, even though he's playing like an absolute bot. So, anyways, that's the idea. There's only a couple of things that they can do to defend. You know what we do from a power play perspective, right? So what then matters is, okay, so there's only a couple things that they can do to defend our number one thing. So we want to make sure that our number two thing, our counter, cannot be defended by the, de the same defense that can defend our power play. And I know it sounds super basic. Man, that is an important point. It, it really is. Uh, a lot of people don't, don't, they don't really do that. They kind of just call money play after money play after money play that doesn't really fit together. Um, Peyton Manning was famous for this. And this, I've done a lot of research on his offense as well, you know, but they basically had that kind of, if then this, that structure within their offense. And they wanted to call plays that, that really fit together. They're also famous for not having a lot of plays uh, and having not a lot of formations. They wanted to make everything look the same so that, you know, basically pre-snap you're given the same, kind of general look that you're given, you know, otherwise. So that's another kind of element to the way that they played, uh, to the way that they played the game. So you don't need a lot of plays is, is, is what I'm trying to say. If you execute those plays at a high level and you understand kind of what they're actually able to do to stop you, that is super, super important. So when you go to your counterplay, then you are inevitably going to call up a counterplay, of course. You just want to make sure, like in this case, Durham, it can't really be defended the same way that corner strike can be defended, right? There's just so much. There's just so many things. Like right here, you see there's that post wide open. He has to drop a 30-yard flat back to, to defend that. And then, you know, we kind of get into this, if this, then that game. And that's really where constraint theory plays come in. So a constraint theory play – in the context that we were just talking about, about like the Packers and stuff, a constraint theory play is really good for if they start to get over aggressive, they start to blitz a lot of people, they start to do a lot of stuff like that, then we want to go to what we call constraint theory plays. Constraint theory plays are plays that we call to ensure that we are living in a perfect world. The reason they're called constraint theory plays is they're meant to constrain the defense and basically take advantage of super overzealous and over pursuing defenses. And as you see, the RPO is the perfect example of that. When they start blitzing a lot of people, when they start doing a lot of stuff, that's where, you know, really this RPO type stuff is really effective. And it's really, you know, it's, it's really effective from, again, that power counter constraint type of thinking. They can't defend the RPO the same that they can defend the double corner the same that they can defend Durham. That's the basic structure of if this, then that, and really why you call what you call. You have to have a purpose and a plan for that. I do think that one of the big weaknesses of the air raid offense, if you look at uh, college football and you kind of watch and you say, okay, what's the big weaknesses of air raid or wh where does things kind of break down? The biggest challenge for air raid offenses is typically on the drop eight coverages. They the 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 super you know drop eight max coverage double Mabel cover four drop with yellows, kind of the standard like super super drop back defenses. Those defenses tend to do better against air raid the bend but don't break style of defense. 
the reason that that's important to kind of think through is where does the air raid need to get better? Well, they need to get better at beating drop eight coverages. One of the best ways to beat drop eight coverages is, you know, what's the weakness of a drop eight coverage? If we just, if we just think about it, like a drop eight coverage would be like what I'm doing right here at a Mabel. What's the biggest weakness of double Mabel? The biggest weakness of double Mabel is number one, the fact that the, I mean, yeah, you only have two deep zones, but Really, the biggest weakness of it is the pressure. There's not a lot of pressure. You're only sending three people. So you're forcing your opponent to be patient and find the holes in the coverage. And Double Mabel, um, you know, for all the flack that it gets, it doesn't have a lot of holes in the coverage, right? There are holes in the coverage. It's mainly in the middle of the field, but there's really not a lot of holes for them to find. And so if they're not intentional about planning for that they're not going to have a, a constraint theory play to manipulate that so another good example of a constraint theory play would be a double mabel beater right a maybe a one play touchdown against cover two a one play touchdown against cover three a one play touchdown against cover four those are good examples of kind of constraint theory methods that can do a really good job of manipulating when they're getting stagnant, when they're staying in the same thing, when, you know, you know what I mean? Um, so like for, for example, having a good, you know, kind of cover to Mabel, like for example, tight offset tight end is a great one. The play PA seams has a corner route that if you put a streak, it's going to get over the top of a double flat or double Mabel coverage. So it's a great little, what again, I would call a constraint theory play right or maybe a really good man beater uh, for example this play out of pa boot over this is a really good man beating route route combo now he's not running a lot of man so it might not work here um as i almost get shamed and fumbled but you see what i'm saying so you have constraint three plays there's really probably a couple of those those are just really specific play calls when you start to really say okay they're probably going to do xyz that's where these constraint theory plays are really, really, really helpful. Uh, when, you know, so for example, like this guy here, you know, kind of, kind of getting, kind of getting cute with uh, some man ups and stuff. This might be a really, really good play for him, right? We just read out here, throw our little flat, take our read, stuff like that. Um, the idea of constraint theory plays. But again, all of these plays are ultimately high percentage plays that have a specific purpose that cannot be overstated. They are high percentage plays that have a specific purpose when called. They might be a power play, meaning it's a it's kind of a you know it might be a constraint play, it might be a, a it might be a, a counter play, but you have to have a specific purpose. Thanks for watching the video. To get all of our eBooks, head down to the description. Go join the school community. First 500 people to join it will get access to all. Not only are going to, everybody gets access to all of the eBooks for both college and Madden, as long as you're a member, but this will, they will also get access to a full film study analysis where we will be able to dissect your gameplay give you real feedback, real actionable next steps that will help you become a better Madden player. So if you're not a member of our school community yet, head down to the description, click the link down below and go get signed up.